this kind of nuclear proliferation means a couple of things. One is that even those who are calling for the overthrow of the Iranian regimes as the best long-term solution to the problem facing us due to Iran's nuclear weapons program cannot ignore the fact that even a post-regime, a democratically elected, or, de or uh, in the best case scenario, a pluralistic pro-Western Iran, at this point would also feel nuclear weapons because the program itself is so near completion, it's impossible to imagine that a successor regime inside of Iran would abandon the program. And for the Sunnis in the Persian Gulf, Regardless of who is in charge in Iran, the notion that Shiites will have the bomb and the Sunnis will not have the bomb is unacceptable. And therefore, if Iran under any regime is able to acquire nuclear weapons, the likelihood of a nuclear arms race inside of the Middle East is a certainty. And of course, from an Israeli perspective, although there is a distinction, it is a distinction perhaps in, in, uh, in a level, uh, in a degree as opposed to in kind between a Saudi Arabia armed with nuclear weapons or a post-Mubarak uh, Egypt armed with nuclear weapons and an Ahmadinejad's Iran armed with nuclear weapons. It is an existential threat to the state of Israel because these countries are fundamentally un unaccepting of the notion of a Jewish state in the land of Israel. So these are, the dire cons these are the dire consequences of an Iran armed with nuclear weapons that we are facing today, and we again are standing at the precipice of just such a likelihood coming about. The President of the United States and others talk about sanctions. We've seen recently a fourth round of UN Security Council sanctions were passed, and in the aftermath of those sanctions, the Congress of the United States passed sanctions, supplementary sanctions against Iran. And, this past, and two days ago, the EU as well passed such similar supplementary sanctions against Iran. And we hear news reports about the Iranians screaming and moaning and saying that this is harming their economy, and we see indications that this, in fact, is true. But the time for these kinds of sanctions, the notion that these kinds of sanctions would prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons was seven years ago. Today, it's too little too late. We saw in the fraudulent uh, presidential elections last year that Iran's leaders do not hesitate to murder and torture their own people in order to get their way, in order to maintain their grip on power. And we can safely assume after having watched that display of barbarism and self-hatred or rejection of the rights, the, the basic human rights of the Iranian people by the Iranian regime, that a bit of economic privation is not going to push them away from their clear objective of acquiring nuclear weapons. And so these sanctions, regardless of how biting or non-biting they may or may not be, are not going to change the fact that unless they are stopped, the Iranians are going to build nuclear bombs. And they already have and will continue to develop the delivery mechanisms, mechanisms necessary to wage nuclear war. In the face of this growing threat, burgeoning threat, and a threat to the, to the security of the entire world, we see that the United States under the Obama administration, and indeed in the last two years of the Bush administration, has decided to shirk its responsibility for maintaining and guaranteeing the uh, global security and the global order. The United States has shirked its responsibility and turned its back on its pledge to protect its allies in the Middle East, not only Israel, but the states of the Persian Gulf. And instead of behaving as one would have expected the United States to behave, the United States is behaving in a manner that we have come to expect the Europeans to behave, namely, shirking their responsibilities in their own defense, expecting somebody else, in this case Israel, to take care of the problem for them, and then threatening Israel lest it dare do what it needs to do in order to defend itself, as well as the United States and the rest of the free world from the certain prospect of global war if Iran does in fact acquire nuclear weapons. And let's be very clear. Today, because of the abdication of global leadership by the United States of America for the past four years on the issue, the most pressing national security issue facing the leadership in Washington, there is only one way to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, and that is by attacking with the aim of destroying or setting back significantly Iran's nuclear installations or 
or at least a, a minimum number of those nuclear installations in order to set back Iran a considerable uh, distance from acquiring nuclear weapons. That is the only way, again, to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear armed power is by attacking its nuclear installations. There is no other way today. There is no other way today. The Bush administration dithered for three years until it even began passing sanctions against Iran and the new UN Security Council. And those sanctions, although binding, were never biting, they were never strong, and they never gave a very clear position to the Iranians that this, in fact, was unacceptable, as former President Bush said repeatedly it was. Current President Obama has never made it uh, made a serious uh, uh, case for why Iran will be prevented or why he has any credibility on the issue of preventing Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Indeed, despite the fact that he signed the sanctions bill passed by Congress and despite the fact that he supported and indeed sponsored the sanctions resolution that was passed in the UN Security Council, President Obama continues to maintain faith with his appeasement policy towards the mullahs. Only last week, Again, the, the Iranians rejected still a new American attempt to sit down and negotiate with them. According to Iranian and Swiss news agencies, the Swiss ambassador, which has represented U.S. interests in Tehran since 1979, transferred a request from U.S. members of Congress to meet with their Iranian counterparts last week. This means that despite all of the bluster, all of the statements that, uh, that the United States has now turned a corner on Iran is, and is in fact understanding just how devastating a nuclear armed Iran would be, both for U.S. fundamental U.S. security interests as well as the fundamental security interests of a whole slew of American strategic allies, the United States under the Obama administration fundamentally rejects two things. One, the notion that Iran is a true threat, and two, that the United States has to do something about it. So where does this leave us? If we want to avert the sure future that we will face, a future of massive war and massive bloodshed, the likes of which we haven't seen in three generations, there's only one possibility, which is that Israel will attack Iran's nuclear installations. And as we all know, if Israel does in fact attack Iran's nuclear installations, there is an all but certainty that a regional war will follow. Because if Israel attacks Iran, then Iran's proxies, Syria, the entire country, Lebanon, and Gaza, at a minimum, will attack Israel. It's what they've been training to do. It's what they've been arming to do since 2006 and before that as well. Israel will face an intense onslaught against its civilian population, at a minimum, with missiles that are capable with conventional payloads of wreaking havoc on the entire country from Atula to Eilat. Again, because of the failure of the international community to stop the proliferation of ballistic missiles to terrorist armies throughout the region, Israel today has more in absolute numbers, more missiles pointing at it than any other country in the world. Tiny Israel. And it is likely that a large number of those missiles will be shot at Israel. And these are not little missiles. These are missiles that are capable of bringing down the Israeli towers in Tel Aviv. And that is in the best case scenario that we're looking at missiles being shot at Israel with conventional payloads because we know, of course, that Syria has biological and chemical weapons already. At any rate, this is the threat that Israel faces. And it faces it essentially alone because the United States has decided that it is pretty well willing to accept Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. Now as for Israel, when we talk about the threat that Iran manifests to the entire world, we understand that one of the reasons why the entire world, and specifically the United States, which is of course the only country in the world that might have been expected to do something about this, uh, the thing that differentiates Israel from the rest of the world is that we're first on the target list. We are facing a genocidally anti-Semitic regime in Iran. The Iranian people may or, not, may or may not hate Jews, but it is absolutely clear that everybody in a position of power in Iran does and does genocidally so. We see that these Iranian mullahs who want to wipe out the Jewish state and want to eradicate the Jewish people or allow us to live as subjugated minorities 
who live at the whim of people like Ahmadinejad, we see that they are amply assisted by the left throughout the West. I didn't see, but my mother was telling me that yesterday on Fox News Sunday, Howard Dean was on, and he was comparing uh, conservative uh, journalists to the Iranians. And this is the kind of dementia that has really seized uh, uh, very influential circles throughout uh, the American body politic, particularly on the left. And again, I return to Oliver Stone, where I started, saying that Jews control America, Jews control U.S. foreign policy, and that we use the Holocaust as a whip to try to keep the goyim in line. This is a man who has three Oscars, who puts out uh, movies of conspiracy theories like uh, some people uh, put on a new pair of shoes. And he's listened to, and he's influential, and this is the kind of bile that he's spewing, along with a lot of his friends. And again, these views have taken, have taken root in very influential circles throughout this country. So what does that really mean? I think that it means something for the Jews in this room, and I think that it means something for every single Jew uh, who cares about the survival of the Jewish people, and I think it means something for every single non-Jew who supports Israel and believes that Israel is, in fact, the front line of defense of the free world against the powers of barbarism that are attacking us. And I think that what that requires from every single person in this room and every single person who understands that Israel is something that must be defended because of what it represents not only to the Jewish people and what it means for Jewish survival, but what it for means for the survival of the very notion of human freedom. And that is that every single person who understands what is at stake must make his or her voices heard today. Must make his or her voices heard today ahead of the elections to the US Congress. Must make his or her and her voices heard today regardless of what's happening in American politics or in European politics or in Israeli politics. And those voices have to say, we stand with Israel. And we understand that if our leadership is abdicating responsibility to the survival of the free world, and Israel is standing up and taking up the slack, then it is Israel that has to be defended at all costs. And if our leaders want to tell us that there's something wrong with Jewish power, we want to tell our leaders through our congressional uh, representatives and in our own voice that this will not stand. That we, and specifically, that we demand that in the event of a regional war that the United States of America will resupply the Israel Defense Forces with whatever armaments are necessary to maintain the defense of the State of Israel. Moreover, that there should be absolutely no linkage between the survival of Israel and anything else that the survival of the Jewish state and the prevention of Iran's acquisition of nuclear weapons is more important than anything else. It is not linked to a peace process or lack thereof. It is not linked to anything. It is not linked to where Jews will or will not live. It is linked to the will of the Jewish people to survive, and that is all.